Okay, today is July 26th, 1993, and we are continuing our interview with Paul A. Wolken. When last we met, we, uh, you were reminiscing about some of the presidents of the Institute, and in particular, in particular you were talking about Harrison Tweed. Uh, uh, you have some more thoughts about Harrison Tweed? Oh, uh, he, he devoted an immense amount of time to the Institute, both to ALI matters and to Ali Abba. Uh, on the ALI side, uh, he had a strong interest in almost every project, uh, particularly in the model penal code as it moved along with Herb Wexler. And uh, it was usual for him to attend nearly all advisory committee meetings of, of, on every project. And uh, he would be in constant communication with uh, Judge Goodrich, the director at that time, uh, about aspects of the work as it was going forward. And his interest uh, showed, I think, in the, uh, improving the quality of the enterprise. He also had uh, a strong interest in continuing legal education. You may recall, I think I said earlier, that uh, it was when he became president in 1947 uh, that work began in continuing legal education, and he was one of the prime movers in bringing that about. Uh, he knew everything that happened in the work on that project. He was constantly uh, calling John Mulder and talking to him about it. And uh, he had a personal knowledge of each of the members of the Ali Abba Committee. In those days, there were frequent meetings of uh, that committee. Uh, I know they met I know they met at least twice a year, once at the time of the ALI annual meeting in Washington. And in, at, in the winter in Chicago, in those days, I think, the ABA had its midwinter meeting in Chicago. And uh, the, the site was the old Edgewater Beach Hotel, I think, on the lake. Those were some of the coldest visits I ever endured uh, in, to that area. And, uh, but Tweed ran the show of the Ali Abba Committee. Uh, when, when I became uh, director of Ali Abba, I, I met with him almost weekly, I think, in New York to review what we were doing. And uh, it was, he was interesting. Uh, I'd come up to his law firm. I think by that time, he retired as an active partner, uh, and one of the penalties of that was a smaller office. But he still had, a, the office still had a good view, and uh, preliminary to every lunch, he'd open a closet, and extract a bottle of scotch, <laughs> and, and that's the way we started lunch. I remember spending one week with him in Chicago at an ABA meeting, and uh, he was there alone, and uh, I spent every evening with him. Uh, what was a threesome, tweed walking and a bottle of scotch. <laughs> and it worked out very well. Uh, his interest uh, in continuing legal education was stimulating. He always egged me on to do more. He was always interested in new ideas and new projects. Uh, he, he was kind of, at one point there, very put out with the American Bar Association because of their uh, inclination to uh, leave Ali Abba. I think I spoke about that earlier. And uh, he, he almost treated that as a personal affront to him, and he became disenamored in those days about the ABA. At one time, I don't know if I mentioned this, at one time uh, he had considered running for president of the ABA. This was while he was also president of ALI. But there was one individual who put that idea down real fast, and I was just learned hand. I understand he told Mr. Tweed, no way can you do both. Conflict of interest or just too much work? Too much. Uh -huh. Focus 
entirely on ALI and uh, mm -hmm. Tweed uh, followed that astute advice. Uh, Harrison Tweed also had a great interest not only in uh, CLE as it manifested itself in Ali Abba, but in spreading the word nationally. Uh, you may recall that one of the primary objectives of Ali Abba was to uh, interest the uh, local and state organizations uh, emulating what we were doing, uh, in other words, organizing programs and continuing legal education. And uh, one of the ways Tweed thought of encouraging this was to build up a camaraderie among the various CLE administrators as they were being appointed and increasing in number. Uh, originally, I think there were but four or five, and uh, it's happened that ABA meetings, uh, John Mulder and I would meet with uh, three or four or five administrators and we would talk very informally about what we were doing. And I went back one time with John and said, John, you know, we ought to formalize this group and have the administrators form an organization, the professional organization of CLE administrators. Well, John took that uh, idea up and he Felix Stumpf, who was the CLE man in California and uh, who really contributed a great many innovative ideas to continuing legal education, particularly in the publishing area, uh, was receptive to the idea when it was put to him by John. And uh, there were a few people then, uh, I'm trying to recall who their names was, uh, were. There, there was Felix, I think there was somebody of the name of Eli Jarmel, uh, Richard Milstein, as they may have come in at different times, but uh, that, that was the nucleus around which uh, an organization by the name of, now called Association of Continuing Legal Education Administrators, was organized. And uh, the organization uh, grew from a handful to uh, many, many members that it has now. But the origin of it goes back to uh, what John Mulder and I were talking about as a result, uh, when we participated in these informal sessions of a few of us. So that was a major development in the uh, uh, nationalizing and spreading of the word of, uh, of CLE, then the, the well, uh, having, a, uh, having a national organization of that sort. What actually uh, did to its credit was it, it provided a forum for those who were members to learn of the techniques for advancing CLE. Uh, in those days, uh, particular jurisdictions would have partic special ideas of how to spread the word, how to have better education, how to improve quality, how to have more people attend. And they would come to uh, an ACLIA meeting. Uh, ACLIA still meets twice a year at the time of the ABA meeting and at the time uh, of, the, of the midwinter meeting and, and at the time of the ABA uh, annual meeting. And at these sessions, uh, there would be a, a, an exchange of ideas, uh, an exchange of plans, and uh, later on, uh, experts in various fields, such as in advertising or promotion or in learning, would come in and speak to the group. And this has been of great value to those who are responsible for conducting continuing legal education. In those uh, pioneering days, was there any tension in ACLE or among the CLE administrators between the, the local uh, organizations and the national organizations? Uh, well, uh, to some extent uh, there was. Uh, it was a delicate matter. Uh, Ali Abba started out when there were no state organizations and uh, to set an example would conduct programs uh, at the state level frequently. Uh, or on subject of particular interest to the state, such as partnerships, law of partnerships. And as uh, ACLIA grew, or as the number of state administrators increased, each of them was particularly concerned about the welfare of the organization in his jurisdiction, or her jurisdiction. And there was concern that a national organization running programs in a jurisdiction might uh, siphon off uh, attendance, uh, interest, uh, money, and uh, to the detriment of the local organization. 
But uh, this was worked out by discussion and uh, example. Experience showed that this did not happen, that uh, I think the more CLE was offered in a place, the more interest there was in whoever was offering CLE. And uh, in time, it more or less worked out. There, there were a couple national conferences uh, that dealt with the specific, pro specific problem of coordinating uh, activities and uh, avoiding conflicts, uh, and there were sets of guidelines that were developed uh, uh, that uh, CLE administrators, if they, under if they signed up for those guidelines, were expected to follow and did follow, and uh, it, it turned out to be a pretty civilized uh, enterprise all around that if uh, Organization A was doing a program, and Organization B announced it was going to do one, and they would talk about it, and they would avoid any conflict as to time and date and place. Mm -hmm. I take it that uh, Harrison Tweed was a great supporter of uh, moving beyond the original grassroots policy and having uh, Ali Abba become uh, an active sponsor of national programs. Is that right? Well, I don't. I don't know that he uh, consciously. Uh, promoted that or endorsed it. It's it just something that happened. And uh, when it produced uh, substantial revenues, uh, there was little reason to quarrel with it. Uh, it helped uh, spread the word and spread the activity. How, how did John Mulder feel about that? I, I, reading between the lines of your book, I get the impression that he wasn't altogether comfortable with the, with the, uh, with the new approach. Uh, well, J John to his credit, really launched CLE around the country with all the uh, getting it. He planted the seed in many jurisdictions where, that, that flowered. And uh, he had some concern about uh, Ali Abba straying from direct support of all the CLE organizations and, and uh, sort of not giving them the attention that uh, they should have. But uh, he liked the idea, too, because it was uh, mm -hmm. helped support the enterprise, and the enterprise needed all the support it could get uh, in the uh, late 50s and early 60s. You mentioned the one thing that he wasn't comfortable with was, was marketing, the idea of, 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 uh, of marketing the, uh, uh, the CLE product. Uh, that, uh, well, I, 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 John uh, may have had some reservations about that. But uh, he, he, he looked at CLE in a different way, I think, than uh, those who followed him. When CLE was a different thing, different enterprise uh, would regard it. Uh, uh, he, he looked at it as a small town, small state, small enterprise replicated in many places rather than as one over one large enterprise encompassing many facets. Uh, Harrison Tweed, after he stepped down as president of the ALI in 1961, did continue for some years after that as, uh, as chair of, uh, of the Ali Abba committee, I believe. Uh, Norris Darrell came in as president in uh, 1961, uh, but he also was quite active in, uh, in CLE, wasn't he? Yes, well, let me, uh, what, uh, what Tweed's interest to kind of, I should mention this, shifted. Uh, in the, um, forgot the date, but the, President Kennedy had a meeting of lawyers from all around the country uh, out of, to, do, to do something about civil rights. Uh, those were the days when there were problems in some parts of the, the states uh, that, that were uh, involved, uh, the federal government, and uh, Kennedy called a meeting of lawyers from all over the country, uh, in, to the, which led to the development of the Lawyers Committee, uh, it was the Lawyers Committee on uh, Civil Rights, I think. And the he, chair of that was uh, the original chair, and he may have been the one that promoted the idea, was Bernie Siegel, Bernard Siegel of uh, Philadelphia, act, active member in the Institute. But Bernie Siegel persuaded President Kennedy to, that, he, that he, Bernie, needed a co-chair, and the co-chair should be Harrison Tweed. And uh, Harrison Tweed 
sort of was pushed into it, I think, uh, with some reluctance, but after he took the position co-chairing, as uh, being co-chaired with co-chair Siegel, he became a great enthusiast, uh, and he only did a tremendous amount of work in that. And I think at, at that stage, his interest in CLE sort of uh, gave way to this more important cause in his eyes that needed uh, national attention. Right. Now, you mentioned Norris Dow coming in. Uh, yes, uh, he became president. Norris's original interest in the institute was in tax work, and uh, he was responsible for the first tax pr uh, project the institute did in the late 40s, early 50s. Right. And uh, he gave the, gave the project much of his attention. And when it came to choose a successor, the nominating committee uh, chose him. And uh, he entered the scene, uh, became very active. And at, as I mentioned earlier, most of the advisory committee meetings were in New York at the Westbury near Herb Wexler's home. And Norris uh, became a faithful attender at those programs. He was a supporter of uh, continuing legal education. Uh, he worked at it. I don't think he gave it the time and attention that Harrison Tweed did, but maybe by then it didn't need it, except uh, as there was this uh, crisis with the ABA. And Norris worked on that. I remember having uh, the agreement, I think, of 1974 uh, the, between ABA and ALI was worked out under NARS auspices mm -hmm. and under Chesterfield Smith's auspices, then president of president like the ABA. And I remember meeting in NARS Darrell's apartment on Fifth Avenue with uh, Chesterfield Smith and NARS. And, uh, working out the final details of that agreement that sort of put the enterprise back on track, two tracks, that of ALI and that of ABA. It was an interesting meeting. We had dinner there. Daryl sent out for Chinese. <laughs> and uh, it was a pleasant evening and with good results. And ours continued to uh, push the work of the ALI and support it. He was always wanted to get uh, funding uh, to support uh, uh, more work. And one of his ideas was to have uh, an endowment that would pay the compensation of the director uh, and uh, the executive vice president or assistant director at that time. Uh, but uh, didn't quite come off, but we, we, I talked to them in those days about having a capital fund campaign. Uh, there, there were efforts to get people to write the, the institute into their wills, but the capital fund campaign really never came to fruition until uh, Rod Perkins became uh, president. Mm -hmm. uh, Norris Darrell, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, first I guess became active with, in the Institute uh, through uh, the tax work and uh, he may have been one of the few people who was simultaneously elected to the uh, Institute and the Council I believe as a, as a, in 1947 uh, and was very much uh, instrumental in starting that, the uh, work on the federal uh, tax project. Uh, did he remain very involved in the tax work uh, later on oh, too? Oh, ab absolutely. I, I might mention that he had a special connection with the Institute. Uh, Norris Darrell was married to Learned Hand's daughter, Mary. Right. And uh, so that there was uh, special reasons for the affinity mm -hmm. to the astuta, maybe even to his becoming president. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's an interesting uh, sidelight. Right. Well, he uh, stepped down, I think, in 1976 and was succeeded by uh, Judge Cutter for a relatively brief period of about four years. Uh, do, you, do you have any recollections about uh, Oh, yeah. There, one thing stands out particularly about 
Judge Cutter, I might say, uh, gave the Institute nearly all of his time, except uh, that, that he had to spare from his work as a judge. But I remember there that one of the early meetings, we, we Bennett Bosky, Judge Cutter, and I met in Boston. We had discovered, and I think in connection with preparing the budget, that certain charges that were made at the annex resulted in Ali Abba being overcharged. And it was a, added up to a tidy sum. And this was one of the problems we faced early in the administration. The question was, uh, what do we do about this? You know, I think only three people knew about it <laughs> when I pointed out to uh, Bennett and Judge Cutter and myself. And Judge Cutter, straight as an arrow, said, well, we can't let that happen, even though it's going to cost the Institute a substantial sum of money. The Institute has, should reimburse Ali Abba for this overcharge. And uh, that, that's what was done. And I think that incident illustrates the character of the person uh, that uh, imbued everything he did uh, as uh, president of the Institute. Uh, he uh, had a wry sense of humor, didn't have the light touch that uh, uh, Harrison Tweed had, or Senator Pepper, or Doris Darrell. And uh, he was businesslike, efficient, and straightforward. If you read the proceedings or read the, the, an the proceedings of the annual dinner, you will get that sense. I might add, uh, Norris Darrell had a very light touch. Uh, he uh, frequently uh, at council meetings, uh, which were held at the Association of the Bar, would go to the piano. There was a piano in, in, in the room there. And he loved to play tunes. He, he was a good pianist. Uh, I might add, he was the son of, a, I believe, an itinerant minister. And somehow settled in Minnesota and, and later was law clerk to the Supreme Court justice. But he, he had a song where that he sang a ditty about the Queen of Bees <laughs> that I've asked his son to send me the lyrics of it. You might follow up on that. It's, it's really a very cute little ditty. Uh, and he loved to perform that uh, for the council uh, on occasions. Queen of Bees. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I guess the uh, uh, the other president that uh, that uh, you you did deal with was was Rod Perkins, and I I, I, uh, I don't know if any president was ever more identified with with with, with work on a single project, although he was also involved with so many others. But uh, did you ever know one to get so involved with with uh, a project as he did with corporate governance? Well, I think Tweed was very involved. I think. Uh -huh with the model penal code, or perhaps Wexler would corroborate that, yeah. uh, as well as other projects. Uh, and Darrell was involved with uh, mm -hmm. tax projects. But I think uh, no president did as much work, Such hard substantive work, work mm -hmm. on a project as uh, mm -hmm. Rod Perkins did. Uh, there, there were uh, problems in the other projects. Uh, political problems, as it were. Uh, but I don't think they were of the magnitude uh, that they were in a corporate governance project. And that required extraordinary skill, patience, negotiating, mm -hmm. all the skills of a successful corporate lawyer, which Rod Perkins brought to bear with success mm -hmm. uh, in the corporate governance project. Uh, that. I think was almost coterminous with his administration as president. Right. Somehow and other institute projects have a way of living beyond their projected lifetimes. In fact, several times over their projected lifetimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, corporate governance was such a project. Uh, so. Uh, yes, it was originally it, supposed to last only three years, I believe, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, it, it, uh, and we set it up on that basis. Uh, I remember. Uh, working on a budget, I suggested that, you know, that if we're going to do it in three years, we ought to have more time from the reporters. And uh, we gave them compensation that was several times the normal 
uh, rate of compensation on the theory that they would devote time and bring it to fruition within a very short span of time. But that was another unfulfilled prophecy. I get, uh, can you think of any other project that, uh, in which uh, the, the climate was so... Uh, um, uh, Charged. Misjudged, so misjudged that that uh, that we that well, expected to, it to be easy, and it turned out to be much more. Not to that extent. Uh, there were uh, the model penal code had uh, periods of stress. I don't think of the same. You know, there was the uh, death penalty, and uh, it was decided there instead of taking to have a vote of the members. Right. I remember looking it up for Charlie Wright recently, and. There weren't that many people who actually participated in that vote. But there, well, there weren't that many members those days. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there, there was uh, concern about, I think, uh, abortion in that mm -hmm. project. Uh, and uh, there was concern about uh, cons consensual acts mm -hmm. among adults. So, but, but they didn't take on the crusading element that we saw in the from on the part of the opposition in the uh, corporate mm -hmm. governance project. In the Taurus project, uh, there was, uh, to Prosser, there was some opposition, but that, w uh, that, that was usually uh, voiced at, at the, uh, during the discussion at the annual meeting and overwhelmingly over defeated, so there was no continuing uh, fight on that. And in the tax project, uh, there was one of the tax projects. There was considerable uh, opposition to uh, some of the ideas Jim Kasner was uh, advancing in the uh, federal state gift tax field. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, and uh, I might say, the tax section at the time had showed some members anyway showed hostility to ideas that. Stanley Surrey was advancing in the income tax project, and particularly to Jim Kasner uh, with uh, his uh, proposals. His first draft just was, as I recall, had to be abandoned. But it's interesting to note that the ideas Jim espoused have become embedded in the law, the marital deduction and uh, transfers among spouses, uh, I'm not a tax lawyer, I'm just trying to recall some of them, and uh, treatment of the uh, taxation, subchapter J mm -hmm. project, the uh, matters that these sections had uh, mm -hmm. opposed uh, are now in the main embedded in the uh, tax law. But there, were, there was some, there was opposition on the council there to some of the ideas that were advanced in the tax project. There was a very ardent support of the Institute of Mr. Miller, who uh, I think at one time was commissioner, mm -hmm. who uh, thought ideas being proposed were far too radical, mm -hmm. and, as, and so did some of the tax section. But uh, I think the, those controversies turned out to be more civilized, I think, mm -hmm. than the controversy that erupted in the corporate governance project. Yeah, I gather Herb Wexler was quite appalled at the, the organiz, organized quality of the opposition to the corporate governance. And oh yes, yeah. he he he, uh, he was he would have been appalled to any organized opposition mm -hmm. uh, lobbying, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so was I think in a sense uh, Rod Perkins, yeah. uh, and he's he if you read the proceedings, I think he mm -hmm. stated uh, what the proper conduct of an ALI member should be and. Yeah when he differs with a project, the uh, recommendations of a project, and how it should be mm -hmm. dealt with. Right. But everything turned out, I guess, as well as could be expected. <clears throat> but the, and the Institute was, has never been really a stranger to controversy and wouldn't expect to be, I guess. No. And, we've, uh, and uh, I imagine that will continue. Well, you've talked about uh, Jim Kasner a little bit, uh, and uh, was he the one of the, perhaps the most memorable of the reporters that you've worked with, I suppose you... Oh, I think all, all the report, most of the reporters were memorable. I think Stanley Surrey was mm -hmm. superb as a reporter. Uh, and uh, as originally he was a reporter, I think, on the 
federal income tax project. Uh, later on, he, he, he thought it was a flashpoint for people in the section. Uh, some of the ideas even that he had when he was in government at, in the Treasury uh, roused considerable uh, opposition. And uh, after the federal income tax project uh, was completed, uh, sort of doing work on taxation became, was dormant. And I had a number of conversations with Stanley, and uh, I think he and I conspired, in a sense, to have the Institute go back to tax projects. And I, general persuasion I used on Herb Wexler, I think, won him over. And the Institute then embarked on uh, other tax projects. Stanley sort of was the uh, coordinator or the overseer. He was not the active reporter, although he would be sitting at this table with the reporters. Uh, Anderson came in and... Uh, this was in contrast to the original project when he was the reporter, yeah, I guess, yeah. back in the 40s. Yeah, and then even on Kasner, when Kasner started, uh -huh. uh, while Stanley was alive, he was sort of a... Uh, I'm the pre I'm the present uh, on the project. Uh, he worked well with all the reporters, uh, and uh, we had sub sub chapter K, sub chapter J, you know, uh, the uh, international aspects. international aspects, uh, accessions tax study by uh, Bill Andrews. Bill Andrew. I said Anderson should be Bill Andrews, mm -hmm. and uh, but Jim. Uh, he had a remarkable career as a reporter. It started almost at the beginning of the Institute and uh, lasted in one way or another throughout his lifetime. He may have been a reporter on more projects than any other individual. Uh, and uh, he had his way of challenging the audience to respond to his outrageous statements and then working things around so it came out, everything came out the way it should. C.V. and Scott were great reporters. Uh, C.V. was did agency, and uh, with Scott did restitution. And Scott, of course, did, did trust, and, and and they were uh, almost unchallenged as reporters. Willis Reese had real difficulty. He was the reporter on the conflict of laws, and uh, early in the. Days, he, he aroused the antagonism for some reason of a number of council members. Uh, Willis uh, had, had some remarkable new ideas and concepts that he incorporated in the restatement, the uh, conflict of laws, that, which uh, was the, sub the field was generating all sorts of new thoughts, mm -hmm. getting away from the Beelze and the Ewer conflict. But Willis had a very loud voice that he couldn't really modulate. Mm -hmm. And Willis had another problem that the, the, when there was disagreement, he would agree with everybody. <laughs> and and this, this was difficult. And he particularly got learned hand upset about, Judge Hand about that. And it reached a point where there was a special meeting of the executive committee that was, that was called really to uh, see what they're going to do about the reportership for conflict of laws. Well, uh, I did some lobbying with some people then. I didn't want anything to happen to Willis. And uh, the solution was to appoint a reporter with them. I forgot what his exact title was, uh, Professor Scott. And after that, uh, the project went on and to conclusion after a long period of time. Uh, as you may recall, there was even difficulty with uh, conflicts later on in the... Um, the, uh, the, the, the revisions in the, uh, in the late 80s? Uh, not the, the revisions so much. Uh, very recently in the... Uh, oh, in the, uh, the complex litigation complex project. Complex litigation uh, project. Yeah, they're very difficult questions. Some, and, yeah, some of the uh, uh, scholars, some of the members of the Institute complained that the uh, proposals for the complex litigation project were, were uh, going back to more specific rules and retreating back to the first restatement rather than the greater right. flexibility of the right. second. So... Uh, and guess, fought, excuse me. No, I guess it's a continuing battle over yeah. uh, uh, conflicts. Contracts was a long, enduring project, but uh, Alan Farnsworth did a uh, superb job on that. 
Uh, he replaced Browker uh, uh, judge yeah. Bra when Browker became judge. Yeah, well, I guess. Yeah, Browker, of course, was uh, first rate as a reporter, and, and that project. Well, both both Browker and Farnsworth really mm -hmm. contributed a great deal to the ultimate success of that project. Um, what about uh, uh, Prosser on uh, the second restatement of torts? Uh, well, Prosser was. Uh, a freight train, or not a freight train, an express train that mm -hmm. you couldn't stop. He had uh, ideas, and, and he had very supportive advisors, uh, Wex Malone, and uh, to name one of them, and the uh, Keatons, uh, and uh, Justice Trainer, and uh, he he would he came in with. Uh, what was it, 420 or 402A? 402A, and mm -hmm. uh, I think at that point uh, the objection was raised that there were only two, or th you could only cite two or three jurisdictions for the proposition, but he was confident he made the statement that in time everybody would adopt the 402A, and uh, yes, he was right. his forecast was correct. So uh, he, he was, well, all the Institute had. Many, many great reporters uh, uh, each had their own style. Now, take judgments, for example. Restatement of judgments, originally, I think, was done by Scott and Seavey, who also did jointly, uh, if I remember correctly, restatement of restitution. Yes. And then when it came to do a new restatement of judgments, uh, they selected uh, Professors Kaplan, Ben Kaplan. I don't know if he was a professor then or already on the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. And uh, the uh, Shapiro, Shapiro. Uh, and they were well on their way when uh, I think Shapiro was taken ill and uh, matters came to a point where they had to have a new reporter and who would, who they select? They, somebody by the name of Professor Hazard who mm -hmm. did a tremendous job on that restatement. And, I think so impressed everyone with his work that that was the reason for his ultimate selection as uh, director to succeed, among other reasons, but that especially to succeed uh, Professor Herb Wexler. Just as uh, Wexler had become uh, director after having done such a good job with the model penal, penal code, code as reporter. I can right. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, people like Scott and CV were, 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 were virtually unchallenged. Uh, was it, I, I, I sort of you, you, I get the impression that the second restatement of trust, for example, was uh, was uh, did not vary all that much from the first restatement, and, and because of Scott's authority, it, uh, it it was it was more of an updating job than a real revision the way we're used to now. Is that right? I think that's right, and probably true. It may have been true of agency also, mm -hmm. which CV did, and right. Scott did trust. A conflict of law second restatement was a, a complete changeover, departure in theory and rules. Contracts uh, became a different kind of restatement uh, in the hands of Broker and uh, mm -hmm. you get Farnsworth. The and at that time, the, there was a great influence of the Uniform Commercial Code. Right. They interacted between the, the two of them. You get the impression that, uh, as a matter of fact, that uh, the earlier uh, restatement, second uh, restatements, were essentially t regarded as revisions. They have they followed the same section numbers and the same order and so forth, whereas the later ones seem to be more complete rethinking. And I, uh, uh, in torts, you had. Uh, 402A, they, they threw in as, a, as a, uh, instead of renumbering things, they just, uh, to follow the usual pattern, they just uh, put in a 402A. And contracts uh, was following the original order, I think, for a while, and then halfway through it, they suddenly decided to reorder the whole thing, and subsequent projects have been much more complete revision. Well, as time went on, the, the work for rules for institute mm -hmm. efforts became less rigid. Uh, this, one of the differences was between the first restatement on the second restatement, where the mm -hmm. uh, second restatement had it as notes, reporter's notes, cited authorities, mm -hmm. uh, didn't speak, as Goodrich used to say, so much ex cathedra. 
And uh, I guess as the go into the third restatement, there's still more flex flexibility. I should mention another uh, reporter that made a lasting impression was uh, Butch Fisher on the international uh, foreign, relations foreign relations law restatement. Uh, there, there, that, that's, that subject evoked uh, controversy on some of the particular sections. Yes, so, it, certainly, it certainly did. Uh, I can remember the controversy with the second one in particular, the, uh, the famous incident where uh, uh, the project was delayed for a year so that uh, there was a chance for more comments at the urgings of the uh, uh, State Department and other government agencies. It seems as the work of the Institute gains more and more influence nationally, it also gains, brings in more interest and mm -hmm. therefore more controversy because there's a wider audience sure. with uh, more diverse interests to respond to the, what's being put forward. One other reporter I wanted to ask you about, uh, maybe the, the only reporter I can think of who uh, subsequently became not director but president uh, of the Institute, uh, Charles Allen Wright. He was, of course, a reporter for the Division of Jurisdiction Project. Uh, yeah, he and... Um, Field. Was Field it? of Harvard were reporters mm -hmm. on that. And uh, Charlie Wright was elected to the council following that reportership uh, in, in which he was a uh, ardent participant in the affairs of the council and very devoted member and uh, his contribution was such that when it came to selecting a successor his name loomed larger and larger and ultimately uh, he was the choice uh, the, the, uh, it's interesting to note, we were talking about the increased opposition that, and how the ways the Institute have changed over time uh, uh, from an original, very rigid set of rules to be followed. Uh, things have become broadened and practice has become uh, uh, more flexible, and an illustration is the, uh, for example, the degree to which members participate in the work of the Institute. Uh, the, uh, at the time Jeff Hazard became director, uh, I, I think I suggested him that there ought to be, uh, or we discussed that there ought to be committees on program, Institute program, and institute procedures, and, and uh, I had for some time harbored the I notion that it'd be in interesting to have uh, members of the institute invited to review a draft uh, prior to its going to the um, advisors, the notion being that why wait until the annual meeting to have the input of interested members, at which point the uh, drafts are pretty well formulated. Why not have their input at an earlier stage so that the advisors and reporters will have the benefit of it when the advisors meet, and then the council will have the benefit of the advisors and the members and so on down to the annual meeting. And there was a special committee appointed uh, and, and uh, on both the idea of program and on procedure. and. And this members' consultative group idea was adopted. That member participation was there given was the group. name of members' consultative group. Yeah, there, there was a committee, I guess, on member participation. Yeah, that, 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 that I think Gerhard. Uh, no, that that was on that was the proceed, committee on procedures. Gerhard Casper, Casper was the uh, yeah, chair and he was that. chair of one of those. Mm -hmm. And uh, out of out of that, uh, I, I think that members' consultative group is really increase the interest and participation of members in, in the affairs of the, in the projects of the Institute. And uh, I, I think that, uh, as I recall, when Rod Perkins became president, he indicated that that was one of his great priorities to find ways of getting members more involved uh, than simply uh, at the annual meeting stage. At least the members uh, that, that's to. true. Uh, they, they, 
the member participation rule re used to be that the member was required to attend. If he didn't attend three meetings, he could be dropped from membership. One every three years. One every three, something like that. Yeah. And uh, the rule was never really enforced. Uh, but uh, the, the rule was broadened to say that uh, participation could be in, take several forms. Uh, attendance at meet, in addition to attendance at meeting, members consultative groups, and participation in Aliaba affairs. And I might add that uh, the mem some members of the Institute have made great contributions to work of Aliaba, and that uh, they, to this day, have been very active in programs and publications of Aliaba. Can we have a recess? Okay. Well, we're uh, con going to continue the uh, discussion now, and I think that a question that probably a lot of people have about the Institute and the way it uh, gets things done is uh, the decision-making process in terms of the relationship between a president, a director, and in your case, an executive vice president. Uh, uh, did that ever cause any 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 uh, uh, problems or difficulties or uncertainties as to where the uh, lines were, or was that uh, easily easy to draw? Oh, there there were no lines. Uh, it's a question of talking, to, communicating. Uh, if I had some thoughts, I would tell the director or the president. And the president had ideas, he'd tell the director and me. And if there was any difference, we'd discuss it. Uh, ideas would be advanced, they might be rejected, mm -hmm. very seldom that that happened, and it was a co cooperative enterprise without any uh, friction or problems in that respect. Everything, uh, I think, worked remarkably well. Uh, the other aspect of it, uh, not directly related to that question, was the, the notion of having uh, the Institute and uh, Aliaba together. Uh, as, as you may recall, it started off originally with Aliaba being under John Mulder and Institute under Goodrich. And uh, ultimately, uh, when I became involved in Aliaba, and, and particularly in 1963, when I became uh, the director of Aliaba, I was sort of sitting on several chairs. And uh, the, the thing worked remarkably well, I think, because of the lawyers that we had in the office working. Uh, everybody uh, viewed the enterprise as uh, being well integrated, whether it was Walt McLaughlin, who was in charge of administrative services and fiscal affairs, or uh, Don McClay, who was in Aliaba, or yourself uh, when you were working primarily in ALI, uh, and Mark Carroll, uh, Sharon, Larry Meehan. Meyer Kramer. Meyer Kramer. Uh, Meyer Kramer at one time was in charge of both publications and periodicals. Mort Freeman. Uh, the, it was a, no, nobody felt that uh, they were confined to their activity if they were called upon to do something in, the, in another sphere of the either operation. And uh, particularly in the area of uh, common services that uh, like printing and accounting and personnel, uh, never any problems. Uh, there was no question of priorities. Everything was discussed. and. Uh, we did the best we could, and it worked out. And I think the, the, the people that were involved uh, in the work of Aliaba and of uh, ALI really made the enterprise har a harmonious one. And uh, working as a team without any thought of there being two different entities uh, here. Uh, same thing applied to uh, our headquarters. We started off at uh, 33rd and 36th and Walnut. Uh, when it time came time to leave there, uh, I went over to, uh, I think, 133 South 33rd Street. And we 
had a very nice offices there, and, and then uh, when we moved to 4025 Chestnut Street, uh, we all worked to make this a uh, pleasant environment, good place to work. And we started, I think, on one part on one floor here, and now we have three floors. Uh, that connection, uh, uh, we had the ongoing ne negotiations for many years with the university about going back to the 40s, we were, when law school was uh, doing some renovating, there was talk of our moving into the law school and negotiations, but that never came about. And all the time, uh, that, that kind of talk continued. What can we do to uh, have a closer identity with the law school? Uh, Bernie Siegel, who was treasurer of the institute and later, I think, vice president, uh, also a trustee University of Pennsylvania, kept those discussions going. Uh, I remember several meetings uh, with the president of the university about doing something to uh, have a permanent home for the institute in the university. There was even the executive committee when the law school was going to put on the addition. There were several things discussed. One was that they would have a research center on Sampson Street across from the law school. We would move in there. Another was that it would be on, on the other side of the street. And th these were the continuing discussions about locating the institute in the law school. Well, ultimately, we moved to this building, and when we moved to this building, this building was owned by uh, a uh, private entrepreneur, and the tenants were the university and we. And uh, th by continuing our discussions about a closer liaison, uh, ultimately, uh, this building was purchased by the university and the institute as a joint enterprise, and then uh, Bernie Siegel played a significant role in that, working with the university, and then ultimately we decided uh, would split ownership was not the best of worlds. We would have one ownership and uh, got involved in negotiating that, and now the institute owns this building, uh, which brings me back to uh, the role of the treasurers uh, in the institute. The first treasurer I recall was a Washington tax lawyer by the name of Larry Williams who uh, was very active in our tax projects, and he was an advisor on, uh, and prime mover in those projects. And Larry was a superb treasurer, and, uh, but not in detail. Bernie Siegel succeeded him as treasurer, and uh, Bernie uh, and I worked harmoniously. We did most of the work here and sent it to Bernie for his final approval. Uh, I remember check signing became a burden. In, in those days, the treasurer signed the checks, and as our activities increased, the number of checks grew uh, exponentially. And ultimately, it was agreed that uh, I would do the check signing under appropriate resolution of limiting a certain amount. And that, that worked pretty well. But Bernie uh, went over the budgets and, and the like when it came to presenting the budgets to the uh, executive committee. And Walt McLaughlin and I would, would prepare them, and Bernie would approve them. Then Bennett Bosky became treasurer. And Bennett, was a, 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 as a treasurer, was a much of an activist. Uh, he, I think, has a secret desire to run the Institute personally and to <laughs> be involved in every facet of its operation, which was showed great interest in the Institute and willingness to devote much of his time to our endeavors. And he took a personal interest in almost everything that involved the expenditure of money and even in uh, what our projects would be and what we would do. And I think he still does that. He's, He's also been, very involved in every reading every uh, word of every draft. Too. Well, I remember how he became uh, involved in the, in the council. He was an elected member, and uh, at the annual meeting on every draft, the uh, Bosque of the District of Columbia would have a contribution to make. And this happened um, project by project, year by year. And uh, at one point, when it came time to have a, uh, 
uh, to elect a member of the council. Uh, I think it was I, with the, the support of Herb uh, Wexler, said, well, there's one man who really participates in the work of the Institute, and he should be on the council. And, and that's Bennett Bosky. And uh, everyone agreed, and Bennett was elected to member of the council. And later on, when uh, Bernie Siegel stepped down as treasurer, stepped up to the vice presidency, the question was, who should be treasurer? And again, uh, I urge with the strong support of her, Wexler, that Bennett Bosque should be treasurer. And Bennett was treasurer. I think uh, one possible correction we might want to make is that I think Lawrence Williams uh, came after uh, uh, Bernie Siegel as treasurer, and well, I think and died, and died in office. I think didn't he in seventy four, seventy five, and then Who? Bosky. Larry La Williams. 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 Yeah, well, that may be right. Maybe it was reversed. Yes. Maybe uh, I, I have think, to I check that. So. Maybe Bernie Siegel was treasurer, and when he became mm -hmm. vice president, right. Larry Williams became treasurer. I thought it was the other way around, but you may be quite right on that. I think I think that may be the case, but we'll we'll have to check to uh, to, to make sure. Uh, on the subject of administration. Uh, and uh, the functioning of the joint enterprise, it clearly uh, uh, having the, uh, Ali Abba uh, sharing the same space uh, and uh, working together in the same building has uh, made a tremendous difference for the efficiency of the operations of the Institute, isn't that right? Well, not only made a difference for the efficiency of the operations of the Institute, but I think for, for a very good part of the time, it made it possible because mm -hmm. the Institute could, could not afford, uh, in many ways, to have the facilities that were required for the kind of operation of printing, distribution, mm -hmm. uh, office space, if it were, the uh, involved alone. Because uh, in those days, the, uh, of the, while we allocated time, uh, in other words, if you worked for the Institute, you would and Ali Abba, you would allocate your time and be, would be compensated from both sources. Mm -hmm. But for a while there, the people that did direct work for the Institute were just a handful as compared to the people that were involved with the uh, work of uh, Ali Abba. So uh, uh, that, that is true that uh, the uh, sharing of physical space, the sharing of equipment, the sharing of personnel to operate the equipment and made available to the Institute uh, uh, techniques and processes that it could not have otherwise afford. Uh, things have changed uh, financially for the Institute. Uh, the Institute's revenues uh, are from dues which go to support overhead and grants which uh, support projects. And uh, then there is revenue from the, uh, its publications, ALI publishers. And uh, that revenue for many years would fluctuate depending on when a new uh, restatement came out or a new edition of a restatement. Then there would be uh, a uh, distribution to what they call, Goodrich used to call uh, the SOB list, which was the standing order of business list that uh, West maintained when a new book came out, it would be mailed to everybody on that list, and there would be revenue from that, and there would be sales. But uh, that, that blew hot and cold, depending on the progress of the work. Uh, and then uh, an idea occurred that uh, was accepted. Uh, I thought that we we had the restatement in the courts, which came out periodically in the volume. Uh, one of the first things I did in the Institute, I think I mentioned earlier when I came here, was to hire young people to make those digests. Right. Well, the thought occurred that publishers were making money and are driving revenue from regular supplementations. And why couldn't we do this by having the restatement in the courts come out as pocket parts? And uh, that, of course, uh, was adopted, and that resulted in, in a more even flow of income, an additional flow of income, because the restatement, of course, what's it published now? Once or twice a year. 
uh, supplements, yes. the pocket parts, and, and that. And then every once in a while, they, uh, sub the, the citations on the subject are gathered up and published as a separate volume. Right. Uh, and the restatement of the courts through this mechanism has really been a source of important revenue for the Institute. You rather modestly said the thought occurred. I, 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 the thought occurred to you, I believe. This was, 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 was I think that I think that may be ideas. right. And also, I, uh, it, it occurs to me that uh, although you, you, I'm sure rightly spoke about uh, how important all the various uh, lawyers uh, in various departments were to the smooth functioning of the organization. Clearly, the uh, you were the one who administered the whole thing and were able to see the entire picture and to, and to keep it running so smoothly. How, how, how are you able to, uh, to do that? Uh, well, I, I think uh, God was good in the sense that he sent good people my way. Really, the, uh, I, I meant it when I said that the, the, uh, the contribution of the staff was mm -hmm. uh, unbelievable. Uh, and the, I mean, look at the quality of the staff we have. Uh, you are a PhD, you're a graduate of Harvard. Uh, we have lawyers that have worked for large, like Mark Carroll and Leslie Belasco, there may be others who work for large law firms, and gave up uh, rather substantial income to come work for the modest sums we were able to pay at least when they started. And uh, I think that, uh, luck was with me and, and the people that uh, we were, I was able to hire to work for the Institute. And I might add that uh, Nobody interfered with that. Uh, uh, people, we, I was the one that interviewed people and hired them, and and uh, I was just lucky that uh, they were top well, quality people. Well, you know, you know, Branch Rickey said that luck is the residue of design, and I suspect there was a good deal of design uh, on your part as well as well as uh, as luck. In doing the research, by the way, for uh, for this uh, interview, I came across uh, a. Uh, some minutes from back around 1949 or 1950 of the executive committee indicating that uh, Judge Goodrich at that time uh, had made a proposal, had received a proposal from the Ballard Law Firm in uh, Philadelphia uh, to make space for Aliaba and have it, uh, a separate office in the Ballard uh, firm's office. Uh, and the uh, executive committee turned down that request, saying that the two organizations ought to remain together. And uh, it's fascinating to think uh, how your career might have been different and how uh, the uh, Ali Abba and uh, the Institute might have been different if, if that uh, d had been accepted. I think if I, as an aside, you ought to dig out those minutes and send it to this special merger committee that's meeting now. <laughs> what, as a what historical... goes around, comes around. As a, yeah, what goes around, comes around. Uh, again, you know, talking about uh, the good fortune of people uh, that we can get, and the illustration is the person who's recording this interview, somebody by the name of Matt Apel. I mean, how do you find somebody like him? You can advertise or do whatever you want, but unless you have the good fortune of having someone like that come and say they want to work here, you, well, you, you will have problems. Well, you, you did have a lot of good fortune then, I guess. Well, I think in, in that, that sense, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, the, the, uh, we were talking about the money flow of the Institute before. Uh, I, instantly, I recall that, I, I don't know if I mentioned, I started to work for the Institute for the, I think, the magnificent sum of $2,600. <laughs> and uh, getting increases in those days was a Herculean task that frequently failed. I, I remember Goodrich, I think, was making, and he gave it a lot of time, $5,000. And uh, he had, it was suggested that, he, he, uh, he, that he, his salary was not adequate. And uh, it was difficult to get uh, the then president to agree to increases. And uh, the, the one who carry the ball on increasing Goodrich's salary, I think by a magnificent sum of $2,500, was uh, William Schneider, who was on the executive committee. And it took some engineering. I don't know whether Harrison Tweed was out that day of the meeting <laughs> or not, but, but Bill Schneider got the increase approved. 
So Tweed was a bit parsimonious. Well, everybody was in those days. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Uh -huh. I think if they saw what we're institute spending now, they, they would really be uh, dumbfounded. Well, I guess money went further in those days, too, though, didn't it? Sorry. Not far enough. <laughs> not, far not, enough. not the money that the institute was paying anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're coming, I think, to the end, for the time being at least, of this, uh, this interview. And I have always found that when I read interviews, I always think that if I were doing the interviewing, um, uh, I would have asked this or I would have asked that. Why didn't that person ask the question? Uh, but I've asked a lot of questions. I know you've had experience doing this, too. You're, one of your uh, accomplishments was to start this whole tradition of, of, uh, of oral history. So as an experienced uh, question asker, I have to ask you, what would you ask yourself that I haven't asked you yet that you think ought to be, ought to be brought well, up? Well, I'd have to review the proceedings to know. I, I'd have to think about this. I, nothing occurs to me offhand. We, we have had one advantage over the uh, previous ones that were done. Uh, they were sort of done on uh, a spot chance basis. I think Jim Kasner's uh, was done at the Mayflower during the annual meeting, and uh, Homer Kripke's uh, was done at a uh, UCC course Ali Abba was running, and Herb Wexler's was done at his apartment, and we spent a day, but in none of those instances did I have the advantage that you have of bringing the subject back for further grilling. Which we, uh, which we may want to do, uh, but... Um let me then, uh, let me just conclude with a, with a question that, uh, that you asked uh, Herb Wexler, which seems like such a good question that I can't resist uh, uh, asking it uh, to you. Uh, you said to Herb, what, if anything, would you do to revise the way the Institute operates, the way its membership is selected, the way the council is elected, and the way leadership is provided? Are there any changes that you think are indicated or would you let well enough alone and think that things are working pretty well and may continue in the same way? That's well, a very broad what question. What was his answer before I answered? <laughs> <laughs> well, he, uh, he said that, uh, let me say that I think that if I were still involved with policy making on those points, I probably would have not favored the principal change that was made in institute procedures, namely opening the matter up to further preliminary discussion among volunteer groups of members. And that's something, of course, that... Uh, that well, that's that, where Herb and I differed. Yeah. I was waiting for a new director to yeah. spring that plan again. Oh, I, I, th I think there ought to be greater communication uh, between the executive committee and the council between the council and the members. Uh, we had a meeting recently, a telephone conference call of the uh, bylaws committee. Uh, I would be all in favor of uh, having the uh, minutes of the uh, executive committee meeting and the council meetings uh, either summarized or distributed to the members. Uh, uh, so the members have uh, a fuller sense of what's involved in the work of the Institute. Right now, I think the, pre the conception is that drafts are published. This is it, and we have a chance to discuss it uh, in a member's advisory group or at the annual meeting. They don't know, they don't fully appreciate the labor and, uh, and thought that goes into producing that kind of draft. And, and if they saw the uh, minutes of uh, discussions at council meeting, or uh, if they were aware of the uh, problems of administration that the executive committee considers, if they knew more about the budgeting process, uh, I think it would make for a uh, greater involvement on their part and uh, have a membership that would be willing to do more to advance the objectives of the Institute, both financially and on, uh, substantively on their projects. Uh, Many years ago, when I first started, uh, there was even less information and exchange between the members, the council, and, and the executive committee than there is today. And uh, I think there's much to be gained by uh, having a fuller disclosure and distribution of information, uh, and, and that this would make for a uh, stronger membership uh, generally. 
In that context, of course, we've overlooked one of your, another one of your innovations, the ALI Reporter, which is a newsletter, uh, does communicate to the membership various things that go on in the Institute. Perhaps that could be a, a, a means of conveying more of that kind of information. Than it well, yeah, except that uh, I think the reporters made a great impression on the membership. Uh, they know things uh, that are happening currently. But I think uh, it still doesn't give the full picture. If you read the minutes of a council meeting and see what goes into the discussion, I, I don't think members have any idea that of the amount of effort, thought, and work involved in individual council members in, uh, uh, in the process of uh, approving uh, drafts. Right. Uh, uh, I think it's something to be thought about. It involves much more work and, and uh, uh, perhaps more money, but we can afford that now. We can even afford more people to help you do this. That would be welcome. Would All be right, fine. so moved. <laughs> okay. Well, you mentioned uh, uh, the council, and uh, of course you are now a member of the council, and, but you have indicated that you don't want to uh, talk about that yet because that, uh, that's not history, that's the future. So I hope that uh, we will be able to get together uh, uh, sometime at a later date after you've had some history on the council and, and be able to t uh, reminisce about that as well. I, I think what we ought to do on these uh, audio visual histories is have annual pocket parts. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that sounds like a good idea. If, and, uh, if the subjects survive. <laughs> well, uh, I, have a, I, I am confident that it will. and. Uh, I. Uh, Again, I think that's another great idea. Uh, I, I might mention I was up uh, last week at the memorial service for Haskell Cohn, who did so much for Ali Abba. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, interesting how many members of the Institute and the council showed up at that. And I guess one reason is that so many of them live up in Boston and mm -hmm. its environs. But uh, there, there was uh, one, of the, one of the speakers was Dean Griswold. and. Uh, Justice Wilkins was there and uh, others, and uh, I think it shows the regard and, quote, love, quote, that institute members have for each other, particularly at the level of the council. Well, um, that's a great note to end for the time being, and uh, we hope we will be able to continue it uh, later on, and you can tell us more about uh, your views of the, uh, the council when you've had more experience uh, as a member. Very Thanks. good. Thank you, Mike. You were good. Well, Thanks very much for, oh. for doing it.